This is episode 41 of the Expert Table Tennis Podcast. My name is Ben Larkham and my guest on the show today is Sam Dance. Now, Sam is a regular listener of the show. Um, he's part of the Expert Table Tennis Academy and he emailed me a couple of months ago sharing his table tennis story. It's a really fascinating story and from time to time I love to get um, kind of regular listeners and readers onto the podcast to um, just you know hear more from um, someone who's kind of down playing in the local leagues on the local level instead of always talking to kind of top international players and coaches. I think it's nice from time to time to hear from you guys. So yeah, this is an interview with um, Sam. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you can relate to his stories and some of the some of the tips and stuff that he's picked up. Um, yeah, that, that's enough from me now. Let's get straight into the interview with Sam Dance. This is episode number 41 and my guest on the show today is Sam Dance. Hi, Sam. Hi, Ben. How are you? Yeah, really good. Thank you. How are you doing? Yeah, fantastic. Now, you are a, a reader, a listener of the expert table tennis stuff, and you sent me an email, um, oh, when was it? A couple of months ago now that I took ages to reply to. I'm terrible at, <laughs> yeah. terrible at reply, re- replying to emails. Um, a lot of people will have got emails from me in the last kind of few weeks that they sent months ago. Um, but yeah, a really fascinating story that you sent in, and I thought it would be brilliant to get you on the podcast to share your table tennis story with the rest of the listeners and just to hear a bit more about how you've been getting on recently. So thanks so much for email, Sam. Oh, it's a pleasure being here, Ben. And yeah, it, it'd, be, it'd be great to, to get into your story. So you said you started playing table tennis at the age of 11. I wonder if you could tell us a bit about how that was like, how you got into it. Yeah, sure. Um, so basically my my dad was working for a big um, computer company and they they purchased a table tennis table there and um, he he was playing a few of the players there and he thought he was pretty good standard for kind of you know people that just play on holiday and he found that he was losing to these players that just had a little bit of kind of experience in table tennis Um, so basically what he did is he just kind of trained and played a bit more and practiced and practiced there. And they developed three players, um, him included, uh, that were an OK standard. So they entered a local league uh, in Hemel Hempstead. And um, he he continued to play and, and got better and better. And then he invited me, myself and my twin brother James down for uh, one of his league matches to just, just to come and watch. Uh, when we was kind of about 10 and a half and um, we we instantly kind of fell in love with the sport just watching how competitive it was we'd always kind of played a bit of football where it's a team sport where and there was something kind of fascinating about this is kind of an individual sport so if you lose the other player is better than you it's not you can't blame it on another teammate you can't blame it on on any of the kind of the surroundings it is literally if you play better than them, you will win. So yeah, that 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 kind of concept is, was really appealing. Obviously, we were twin brothers, so we were very competitive uh, in everything we done against each other. Um, so we just started kind of practicing, uh, playing uh, there uh, before and after his league matches, just against each other. Uh, then we found a local league based in, uh, uh, well, a local club based in Stevenage. Um, and they had kind of, you know, all all kind of variety of standards of players there. So we started going to practice there, and uh, yeah, things we we kind of we believed we had a talent because we were we were steadily improving faster than the other juniors in the club until we got to a level where we were after maybe two years stronger than any other junior in the club. So we. Um, we started winning kind of the, it was like the North Hertfordshire tournaments, junior tournaments. And we started winning those. We would both get to the final and then play each other. And then it was kind of 50, 50 who would win and lose out of us two. Right. Um, okay. So, yeah. so this, this would have been mid to late nineties. Is that right? That's roughly the kind of time that it. Yeah. Yeah. On? Yeah. But roughly yeah, around that. Yeah. Mid kind of mid nineties. Yeah. And you're living kind of just north of London for people that are outside of the UK. So they yes, can... yeah. So about yeah. 20 miles north of London. Yeah. Cool. OK, so you've got you and your brother, James. Um, yeah. Very competitive. You kind of find table tennis, immediately fall in love with it. And you start doing all this training. Now, now you said you're kind of improving faster than other juniors. Why do you think that was? 
at the time i we both believed that it was because we were more talented we we thought we had better hand eye coordination uh, our athletic ability was better but w- when i when i kind of look back now it it's because we had each other that that that's the reason we we were playing against each other we wasn't just learning strokes we were learning how to win whereas a lot of juniors obviously they look incredible in in kind of knockups and forehand to forehand and backhand to backhand but when you get them into a match you can mix chop and flow up and they they start missing whereas we developed a way of of winning matches because we were continually playing against someone that is exactly the same standard so it wasn't to do with um who was the better player it was to do with little things in matches that would kind of mess your opponent up or or just develop little serves that would would win you matches yeah and i assume were you traveling around on the tournament circuit kind of around the uk the two of you we wasn't at that stage we the 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 first thing we did was um we started going to the hertfordshire trials like for the county trials um after probably a couple of years of playing and there was a lot of um a lot of good players obviously a lot older than we were um so we never really got to to kind of actually play in county at that stage um it wasn't until we i think we were 15 uh, where we finished um one and two in hertfordshire so with then we started playing county and we we my dad would drive us around a, a little bit at weekends and we would we would play um kind of ranking tournaments not enough kind of to to make an impact and get a, a decent ranking because it was we wasn't kind of we we had other interests as well even at that time kind of football and um i started developing a love for tennis as well so we would tr- try and throw as many tournaments as, in as we as we could right yeah, and and who who was number one? Who was number two out of you two? Or we, keep, we, <laughs> we spoke about this um, not that long ago, and both of us can't remember who finished one and who finished two. We I've looked, I, I searched online everywhere to see if there's any kind of old archive files of it, and we can't find anything. So we we still because we when we were playing tournaments it, we would play so many especially locally where we were in the final together so i think we just kind of looked at that as another one where we were in the final together so it it hasn't really sticked in the memory of who actually won yeah so so you were always very close always very competitive with each other yes yeah we yeah. were yeah and then so so you managed to reach basically the top in your county you were kind of the the top players in your region um then, for whatever reason, like you, you both stopped playing, or was it just you that stopped playing, Sam? We we actually both stopped playing. We we got put into a um, like a big regional squad where there were like lots and lots of fantastic juniors there, and the it 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 became from kind of half casual to very very serious very quickly. So we was we were doing training camps and playing kind of six hours a day. We ha- we they asked us to fill out food diaries and um where like kind of heart monitors to rest you know to measure our resting rates and things and to us it all became too too serious and it kind of made us fall out of love with the with the sport because obviously we we enjoy playing matches that's what what we did against each other all the time we would very rarely spend an hour doing training drills and things we would play we would knock up forehand to forehand for a couple of minutes, backhand to backhand for a couple of minutes and then play matches. Um, so it all became a bit, um, we, we kind of fell out of love with the sport. Both of us kind of quit practicing at that point, carried on for kind of a couple of years playing league and then both quit at around 17, 18. Right. And then, and then what did you do after that? Did you continue playing other sports? Did you go to university or something? What happened then? Um, we played. Uh, we played. A, we started up a football team with all of our mates. So we were playing um, kind of Sunday league football, pub football, where you get kicked about, and uh, but you get to play with your mates, and it's the sort of thing where you turn up five minutes before kickoff. One of your friends is being sick over from a hangover for the night before, and then you you kick off and 
you just kick people basically that was what what the sport was but very obviously very competitive um I was playing kind of tennis casually I joined up a uh, a club with my friend that was also a keen tennis player never played league or anything but got got to a decent standard um but yeah just working really so table tennis kind of just disappeared for us and it sounds like you've always enjoyed competing and playing matches in tennis table tennis football and stuff maybe you haven't enjoyed so much the real hardcore training that you find at the the kind of established tr- like clubs and training centers and things like that is that fair to say yeah really fair i mean the the element of competing is what i enjoy in sport rather than okay seeing the signs of improvement is is enjoyable but nowhere near for me as the actual you know kind of competition of it all okay great okay so then uh, after all of that you're you're 18 19 whatever um you go off and kind of do something pretty out there. What happens after that for you? So I was I was working in an office doing project management for a few years, uh, for three, about three and a half, four years. And then um, I was I was getting very, very bored in the in the job. Um, I just my dad was in was in this kind of industry and he was in it for like his whole life. And I could just see my life planning out the same way. So. I wanted to do really to do something else. Um, and one day I, well, one night I was out with friends and we, there was karaoke and, uh, I, I got persuaded to go up on karaoke and, uh, I got a very, very good reaction. So, um, a lot of, a lot of people were coming up to me afterwards, shaking my hand saying that was fantastic. And I thought I didn't, well, I didn't even know I could really sing. So, uh, one of my friends that was also there that night, she'd done seasons away before singing um, in various countries uh, for, you know, in hotels and, and campsites and things. So she said to me that if you're unhappy in your job, I can I could set you up with an audition to maybe get some experience doing auditioning. And uh, maybe then eventually you could go away and do a job as a singer. So uh, the concept for me was kind of unbelievable to be say I could. I'd always enjoyed singing, but never like in front of people or anything. So um, uh, it just, yeah, it seemed very unbelievable to me t- to sing and get paid for it. So I I went along to my first audition. Um, it was to go and work in a campsite in France. And um, I turned up to the audition. Everyone else around me was saying, I've just done a degree in performing arts or I've just been to drama school and I thought I am very out of my depth here. So I just basically stood up in front of the judges and I said um, that I have an office job and I will quit if if you give me the job. So and they obviously were looking for something very different and I managed to get the job and then flew out to France uh, a month after that. Uh, I said I would do one year in in singing, and then since then I've I've been doing it now for about eight years in various different countries: France, Cyprus, Spain, um, and England. Yeah, so uh, it, it was very surprising to to kind of go off and and for for eight years when I said I would do one, but yeah, and then t- but table tennis really wasn't even in my mind at that point. It sounds almost a bit X Factor like, doesn't it? Going off and doing some kind of audition you've never really done singing before, and then you get the gig and you're you're like immediately thrust into the world of entertainment. <laughs> yeah. like, if I that, ever went, yeah, sorry, go on. Was that was that daunting or, or anything? Like, I feel like most people would be terrified to go and do that. Well, I believed I had nothing to lose because I I thought that I was just a fraud going to to this singing audition when everyone else around me obviously is trained in it and. And then been doing it for their whole lives, and I'm a, I'm 25 at that point, and um, just kind of, I just thought I had nothing to lose. I would go and sing a, sing them a couple of songs, and then I'd walk out, and I'd, they'd say thank you very much, and that would be it. I was doing it just to, out of curiosity, really. That's cool. Oh, I really like that. Okay, so so you're out kind of now, you're singing in all these different um, holiday kind of destinations, and then somehow you kind of table tennis comes back into your life so so tell us how that how that happened yeah so basically I was at the time I was working in Cyprus um 
doing I was the uh, the Ents manager so I progressed kind of from from singer in the just just to a singer in the shows to kind of running the entertainment in this hotel um and we we used to do activities during the day so you'd have kind of archery water polo and we did table tennis so I'd always play table tennis as an activity in in the entertainment jobs I'd had um but obviously with like one pound fifty bats that have kind of no sponge and just a, a rubber that's falling off. Um, so, but obviously I, I was uh, miles ahead of anybody else because even the players that were play, that played league that were, came on holiday there had, were not used to these bats where, that I'd been playing with for so long. Um, so it, I, I'd never actually lost a game. So uh, it was just a normal uh, normal afternoon in Cyprus uh the next activity was table tennis so what i'd do is if um say we had seven people come uh that wanted to play i would kind of enter the tournament myself to make it up to eight to make it a straightforward knockout competition so it would be a lot easier so that that's what happened on this day there were seven players uh i put myself in uh the tournament was going as as normal i i was kind of just playing along with people and um just just doing enough to win e- each game and i saw uh on the other side of the draw to me there was this this german guy um who c- was quite athletic quite tall about the same height as me about six foot two and he i just noticed straight away that he had kind of just a touch for table tennis he was holding the bat correctly whereas not many of them do um and I, w- I wasn't worried, but I just thought, oh, he's, maybe I'm going to have to concentrate a bit in the final against him. So he inevitably, he got to the final, I got to the final and I played him. And straight away, something was different. I was having to work really hard on on each point to, to win a point. I was about eight, six up and uh, I looked across and he, he, the look on his face, he was really, really worried. And I thought, oh, he's taking this a bit seriously. So he he, he stands there, he gets a bit lower concentrates a bit more and uh, about five points later he'd beat me 11 eight in the final and uh, so the the other girls in my entertainment team they were running around screaming because I'd never lost after probably doing entertainment at that point for about five years I'd never lost to a guest I'd lost legs but I'd never lost um you know like the first leg against someone or um so they were running around screaming basically telling every guest that I'd lost so um, the German guy's girlfriend comes walking up to me and she says to me that, you know, the person you just lost to is 29th in the world. So I, I obviously uh, straight away, I thought she was joking. And then she carried on saying that he came over and he he confirmed it. So I, obviously I went straight onto my phone, Googled his name, and it turns out that it was Patrick Francisca, um, who was at that time 29th in the world. So it, it was um it was just incredible to me obviously this this sport that i'd not thought thought about for all this time and then i have the the 29th in the world come and have a game with me so it after that he um we got chatting a little bit that day and then he came to watch one of my kind of solo cabarets so i sing about 13 songs for about 45 minutes and he was in the audience so afterwards um i went and sat and had a drink with him and his girlfriend and just asked him a thousand questions about about table tennis found out that his coach was your Groskoff, who was at the uh, when i was a junior when i was starting out was like one of my heroes so i was just fascinated and i mean without realizing it in that in just in those kind of that half an hour to an hour of talking to him i was i was just in back in love with table tennis and you've got a video playing him, haven't you, which is on YouTube. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll link that in the in the description so people can go and have a watch of YouTube playing with some dead bats. But like, yeah, what, an, yeah. what, what an incredible story. I feel like that's just like that must have been one of the highlights of your your like working time out there. Oh, it's by by far the biggest highlight because it, obviously people that are not from the table tennis world can't really understand kind of. They couldn't at the time understand my excitement, but they did realize obviously to be 29th in the world at anything is is an incredible thing. Um, but it was just amazing. So obviously after 
he after that night we he would come to and join in with all the activities so we'd play water polo and and we kind of developed this nice kind of friendship where um playing all these activities together and I got to play with him a little bit uh, after that that's uh, when you can see the the filming on the on YouTube um and afterwards he he asked for my address and uh, a few weeks later I had a, a table tennis bat with Tenergy on both sides uh, a signed top from him, a signed picture, just just turn up at uh, my address in Cyprus. That's so cool. And and did he give you some tips as well? Were you asking him for advice? Uh, well, at that time, it was more. I was just fascinated by the world of it all. So I was finding out who who was still playing. Like I remembered um, Jean Michel. Uh, is it Jean Michel Save. Save, yeah. Uh, save that used to play your Groskov. so I was just asking them about about them and do the Chinese still rule the sport and uh, he was talking to me about a, a guy called Zhu Zin that's playing with a penhole grip that's backhanding and I was just fascinated by all this kind of new information that's great okay so then after that you decided that you actually quite enjoyed playing table tennis you might want to start taking it seriously again yeah, well, I, I obviously I received the, this little kind of package from Patrick, and I, I just wanted to play so so bad with this bat, and I couldn't. There, there was no one to play at the hotel, so I couldn't just play against holiday makers with a bat. I would put a tiny bit of topspin on the ball, and it would fly off the table from their bat. So um, I I was just looking on the internet everywhere, asking asking uh, locals and stuff about table tennis. I managed to find a um, a club that that was underneath the um, football stadium near Ayanapa. Um and basically they were training juniors, a, a relatively decent standard. So I I contacted them, and it was run by um, a couple of Greek guys uh, who were actually twins as well, and they they were coaching the juniors, and they said that I could come along and and have a practice, and so. I, I went there whenever I could, basically. So wh- when was that? Was that a couple of years ago now, roughly? That was about, yeah, about two and a half years ago. Okay. So so since then, you've actually been trying to get back into the sport and you, and you've, um yeah, I mean, now you're back in the UK, you're playing, you're playing local league, you're, you're, you're back in it. Yeah. So, ba- so now um, I, after I, I'd stopped traveling about I've, I've come back to England uh, after going to Mallorca last year um, and I've joined my my dad's team actually he's he got back into it about three or four years ago um, and he he he's playing in division one which is the second tier in the North Hearts League so he said to me why don't I come and join his team um, for your first season back premier might be a bit you know a bit too high standard for you so so i jump obviously jumped at the chance and we've i've been playing um this is my first season back and i've the only i've only lost uh two games in that division division one so i have like a an average of about 93 percent or something like that nice so premier next season well we're we're currently top of the the league now with five games to go and we're kind of 13 points clear or something like that so inevitably i think and the the there's two teams that get promoted and the third team i mean are probably 25 points away from us so we will we will get promoted this year so yeah i'll be playing uh premier next year i have actually played two matches for uh another team playing up um in the premier one of them was quite early on in the season and I I managed to win two and I lost to someone that was is about 70 percent in the prem uh, in five uh, I think it was like 12 10 in the fifth uh, and the other team I played were the team that win it every year which is which is Bedwell a um, and that is their best player is Jimmy Walsh who is Ethan Walsh's dad um, and he he's the only guy that's like since I've been back that's beaten me in three straight so a very good player cool so it looks like you've got a good chance of doing well next year and it sounds like you've been you basically just come straight in and straight back to winning ways did you find it was quite easy to get back into competition and to you know to be using all the the technique the tactics to you know to get match fit 
I, f- I found it easier than I thought I I would. I'm not saying it was easy, but it was easier than I thought I would. It was. It's just something. As soon as that ball comes over to you, everything's already kind of installed in your brain from years of playing before. So it's just kind of the timing that that goes slightly. Um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm the this the standard I'm playing is Division One, which I mean there is some good players in in the league, but I often I can I, I'm I'm serving people off the table. So all I need to do is kind of. Uh, I have a heavy backspin backhand serve that that seems to serve people out for at least for the first leg until they get used to it. Um, so I'm kind of I'm still winning matches with little tricks like that with unusual serves and and things. But the timing um, is starting to come back. Kind of I'm trying to play the right way. I'm I'm not kind of going away from the table chopping or anything like that. So I'm I'm kind of trying to attack everything I can. Um, and just play in the right way, even even if I'm missing, I sort of kind of come through in the match um, and start kind of landing, you know, the, the big shots. Yeah. And have you noticed many changes to the game? Uh, you know, like surely a lot's changed in the kind of 13 years that you haven't been playing. What can you see that, that's happened? Obviously, the, the, the ball's got bigger, hasn't it? I think it went from like 38 to 40, which is supposedly slowed the game down. Um I haven't really noticed a big difference in that. Um, obviously, the the kind of going to the plastic balls now, I kind of noticed a small difference in, in regards to um, spin in that I think you have to work harder to generate more spin. And every packet you get, you seem to get two balls that are already cracked or not round. or. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but, but yeah, like the, the changes really... It, I don't find that significant and it hasn't affected my, my playing as much as I thought it, they, it would. Yeah, I think it can be one of those things where if you if you worry about it and you let it affect you, it does. And if you just get on with it, it's, it's actually not that big a deal. Of course, huge, yeah, huge part of any sport or any on any competitive game, especially one on one is is in your head. It's just psychological. So if you're if you're throwing a backhand loop, believing that it's going to go on nine times out of ten, it does. Yeah. Okay. So, so tell us about the kind of the table tennis that you're playing now. Are you are you at a club? Are you getting any coaching? Are you going to practice sessions? What, what does it look like? So I that we have um, a a team. I play for a team called um, Bedwell, and they have maybe seven or eight teams in the in the North Hearts League from all different um, divisions. So and they have a practice night on a Sunday. So um, I go down there. I go as early as I can. They they open the doors at kind of around about four o'clock. So I go down at four and get try and get some decent practice in. But again, it's it's very much knock up for five minutes and then play a match and then move on. The winners go on one side, the losers go on the other side. A bit like top table kind of thing. And then you 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 continue to play like that. It's not really a lot of drills or anything like that. Um, so what I am doing is trying to, uh, I arranged to go and play, hire out, uh, one of the tables, um, during the day when, um, a local player that plays in the premier league, um, had a kind of a day off from work. So we went and, uh, hired a, hired a table basically and did some drills. He has a robot that I was kind of trying to work with, which I found almost impossible at the beginning to work with a robot because, Obviously, you can't see a stroke, so you're getting maybe all this topspin and the ball's changing. And I'm subconsciously, when I'm playing someone, I can see that they've put topspin on it because of their stroke or or the sound of them hitting the ball. Whereas with a robot, I found very, very difficult. Yeah, but that, that sounds like a good idea. If you're doing your matches and then you're also finding a way to go and get some proper training maybe with someone who's playing at a slightly higher level that 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 should lead to some decent improvement for you yeah it really does yeah because I mean it's just li- little things at the moment like um when I'm hitting forehands in like big forehands I'm coming up too much which is restricting my movement if the ball comes back wider or so it's just little things that I'm trying to 
to develop in that in that kind of trying to stay low so I improve my movement again um also on the the practice nights even though it is kind of knock up for five minutes and then play a match i am trying new serves or trying new shots obviously since the since i played there's this new kind of backhand flick uh which is kind of all wrist which i i don't remember that was ever in the kind of in the game when i played before so i'm trying to develop that in practice and not worrying too much about winning the actual matches in in the little practice sessions but but trying to improve shots and and serves yeah, and that's a great way to go about it. Even if you find that you're only really able to do matches, you can still use the matches to to teach yourself stuff and to work on things. Um, you know, it's just about the way that you approach the game. Of course, like you know, they're, they're, you can do so much in in practice. If so, in in a match, for example, currently in a match now, if someone uh, does a big loop at me at the moment, I'm just blocking the ball back. Whereas in when I go down on a Sunday and I'm just practicing, I will try and counter loop, which is not something that's ready for me to do in matches because it's kind of only going on 50 percent of the time. But the more I do that, the more then I can try and apply it in a match. Yeah. Mm, Cool. Okay. well, Sam, you're you're 32. You're kind of a a young guy still in your 30s. I'm assuming that when you go to these clubs, when you play local league, most of the players are quite a bit older. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. So, I, there are still obviously because uh, I'm playing in the same league as I did all those years ago. There are there are players that have never given up. So they have played from my whole kind of 13 year layoff. They've been playing that that whole time um, while I while I'm I've not been playing. Yeah, and so how do you? Because I mean, lots of people drop out of table tennis because they kind of. You know, they, they haven't got the the friends there. They haven't got like a group of guys like you were talking about playing football earlier with all your mates kind of table tennis often doesn't really feel like that when you're in your 20s and 30s, does it? No, I mean, the the thing that I I kind of love about it now is that there are so many different characters. I remember um, kind of uh, I think it was in actually Matthew Sides book in that he said that if you go into a table tennis club and try and pick out before seeing them play, try and pick out the two best players there just by looks, you will never get it right. It could be a 13 year old boy and a 70 year old woman that, that are the two best players there. you can never tell. And that's what I love about the, the, the sport now is that you, you turn up to a league match and you have three completely different characters. So one might be much older um one might and the, what they wear is completely different and what i love that about the 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 kind of this whole like league um local leagues now is that you get so many different characters yeah yeah it, it, definitely interesting characters as well you tend to find oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> we had a uh, we had a player um we i had a league match this week on wednesday and it, uh, it was against a guy that uh, what the only other guy that had beaten me um in this division earlier on in the season it was the return so obviously I was very uh fired up to try and win and I basically I wiped him off the table and um he he was getting very frustrated throughout the night and he played one of my teammates and and lost I think in four or something and the bat he threw threw the bat over like his shoulder straight after the match and you think oh my god (laughs) but but it's just just little things like that which I don't think necessarily are bad for the sport it's but you are, you're having different characters and it keeps you kind of, it, instead of just turning up and playing the same sort of people, the same level, it, it can can get tedious and boring. So, I, you know, different styles, different personalities, I think is uh, is the key to kind of staying, staying interested in the sport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always interesting. So, um, right, let, let, let's think about your future now, Sam. You've been playing seriously again for a couple of years. Um. Have you set yourself some kind of goals? You seem like you're quite committed to to keep improving. So what, what are you aiming for? Well, I want to um, get this season out of the way. So we we are um, hopefully going to get promoted this year into the Premier Division. And then I want to start going to practice sessions. There's there's clubs that are a little bit of a drive away, uh, places like um, St. Neots, 
and Barnet that have like huge table tennis venues there and go and and go and do this this training. I've also um listening to your um expert in a year thing with with Sam in that there it sounded amazing about you know these training camps that you can go to abroad um is something that I really want to do as well and then eventually start trying to get a ranking and playing tournaments and if I can get to at least the top 250 in in the country and then just go from there and and see how much I don't believe that you you can always improve your game I don't believe that there you get to a certain age and then you know you won't improve anymore if you're doing the right practice you will improve yeah Definitely. You you should you should go and check out um the B seventy five camp in Denmark because that's one of the best training camps that I, well, it is the best table tennis training camp I've ever come across. And I always try and send people there and everyone that I've ever sent there has come back with so much praise for it. So if you're free in end of July, B seventy five over in Denmark is incredible. And I know that every year there's there's kind of five or ten um kind of expert table tennis listeners that, that head on over there and they tend to go back every year once they start going because they love it so much oh really yeah i'll have to check that out definitely yeah okay well we're coming to the end of the interview i i like to ask for a top tip at this point so sam i was w- wondering if you've got a top tip to share with the listeners something that you've picked up from your last couple of years um playing table tennis yeah sure so i had a little think about it and basically i mentioned before in that since quitting there are the same players that have been playing say for for this whole 13 years that I've been out of table tennis have gone back into the same league and there are these same same players that don't seem to have improved at all so they are exactly the same standard they were and that's 13 years on I think people get stuck in in the thought process that they they will get to a certain level and then if they haven't got enough talent it, they can't get past that level and i don't i don't believe that to be the case at all i think the a good way of of improving yourself is to look at specific aspects of your table tennis so if you are playing and you don't have um a serve that can win you points in difficult situations uh, or close situations then in practice develop that one serve if you haven't got a forehand flick in practice just develop that forehand flick and then you will see little improvements in your game but uh, if you continue to do that and you've perfected these individual things eventually that is going to be a huge improvement in 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 your in your overall game yeah i really like that i think maybe if we if we can all as players get into the habit of asking each other what's the one thing that you're working on in your game at the moment and then you know, we should all have an answer. There should be something that we're doing. And if you haven't got an answer, then you need to really think, you know, am I working on anything or am I just kidding myself, turning up to training and just playing and then going home? Because if you haven't got some kind of goal, some kind of small thing that you're working on to improve your game, then you are just going to stagnate, plateau. And like you said, Sam, you, you go through local league and you see people that year after year after year, they always get 50% in the Premier Division and they're playing, they're making the same mistakes they are now that they were making five years ago. And there's just, there's no improvement. You've got to have that kind of focus that you're working on something and then when you improve it, you then pick something else and you improve that and you just keep going and that's that's what leads to the snowball of improvement of course it, it, i look at it a little bit like where if you're if you're studying a subject say for example um the human body you wouldn't try to learn it all in one go you would concentrate on certain aspects okay let's start with the bones in the foot it's exactly the same for me in table tennis in that you you if you're trying to just practice and go through all these different drills trying to improve all aspects of your game you're not going to see the improvements it's easier also easier to apply single things in in a steady process yeah and this is where having a coach might help as well because you can say to your coach okay what's the one area of my game that I that I need to focus on now what's holding me back what's preventing me from improving and they're probably going to have a better idea of of what that is than just trying to randomly pick something because sometimes there can be one bottleneck that's really holding you back say like um you know you never learned proper footwork so even though you've got good shots your footwork's holding you back if you sorted out your footwork you'd suddenly improve loads but if you never do it you're just constantly stuck in this kind of game where you're out of position all the time and 
Yeah, so I think I would say try and work on one thing at a time, but also make sure you're you're picking kind of the right thing to work on. Yeah, yeah, it's a great point. Are you are you getting any coaching, Sam, at the moment? No, what, I, what I'm tending to doing is trying to coach myself at the moment in that I am filming um, a lot of league matches and then obviously watching them back and and looking at points that I've lost and think and, and trying to work out exactly why that shot missed or why I lost that point. Um, and to me, that at the moment, that is really helping. I do eventually want to want to start kind of being coached but I know what you know I know what a forehand should look like and I know what a backhand should look like so when I'm watching these videos and I can see myself hitting shots from my crossover rather than moving and playing a proper forehand or it, it's very useful to, to then to start trying to apply those changes in practice as well yeah that sounds great I, I always try and encourage people to do to do a bit of both of that because I find some people they they, they go to a coach and they listen to the coach and then they just kind of switch off when they're not thinking about it themselves. And then other people, they're just reluctant to either ask anyone else for other advice because they kind of feel like, oh, I can do it all myself. I know what I need to work on. I always think if you can maybe do an hour a week with a coach, just one to one, you know, pay someone 20 quid or 25 quid or something. And then the rest of the time you then put that into practice and you're doing that, you know, filming yourself, coaching yourself. I think that's probably the ideal way to go about doing stuff. So, Sam, I'd really encourage you to, to find like a one to one coach if you can and, and just pay that little bit of money to to get like a weekly hour of practice. Because I think that can be really beneficial. But at the same time, it, it sounds like you're doing everything else right. Kind of filming your matches is something that I always push. So, yeah, nice work. It sounds like you're doing really well. Yeah, I hear Ben Larcom's available for one-to-one -one coaching as well. <laughs> yeah, if you're, <laughs> if, you're, if you're in the Tunbridge Wells area. <laughs> right. Yeah. Cheers, Sam. It's been great talking to you. And you, Ben. It's been a pleasure. Really interesting story. Um, I'm hoping that next month on the show, I'm going to get Patrick Franziska because I've been I've been messaging him about something else that he's just started called SpinFit. So it'd be incredible if I got him on the next episode. I can I can mention um, you to him and, and see what he's got to say. That would be amazing. Yeah, I'll be listening. <laughs> cool. All right. Cheers, Sam. Thanks, Ben. Pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, and, and good luck. Thank you. Bye. See you later. So a huge thank you to Sam for joining me on this episode of the show. Uh, it's not easy to come on and just chat and, and do all of that, but I guess Sam's a bit of a natural entertainer, so for him maybe um, not quite so daunting. What a cool story. Incredible stuff to um, to start, to kind of become a decent junior player, then to stop playing and then to, to have that encounter with Patrick and to kind of get your passion reignited and make a comeback. And I know that so many of, of, of the listeners on this show are players that have come back to the sport after a period away and are kind of um, trying to get back into it, to find their old form and to really push on and continue improving whether you're, whether you're in your 30s or your 40s or your 50s or whatever. Um, so I hope that you found that inspiring. Um, it certainly seems like Sam's doing a lot of things right and that you know I'm sure that next season he's going to be doing very well in the Premier and I can't wait to see how he does kind of on the on the UK tournament circuit once he starts getting a ranking and stuff like that so really interesting story if you've got a story that you'd like to share um, you can drop me an email ben at experttablesinners.com um, and we can discuss whether either you want to come on the podcast maybe or you could just um, provide me with like a written transcript and I can I can write it up into a blog post um, if you go to experttablesinners.com com forward slash academy i've just created a page um, which links to my academy email list it links to the academy facebook page and it's got a bit at the bottom where, where i'm sharing kind of stories from um, academy members so some of those are kind of written blog posts some of them are podcasts so yeah i'd love to include you in that if you'd like to be involved um, do let me know send me an email ben at expert com. This podcast is sponsored by Table Tennis University. Uh, TableTennisUniversity.com is the place to go if you're looking for um, brilliant online training courses. They've got people like uh, Tao Li uh, doing courses on there. One of the, the great Chinese coaches that now lives over in Canada. Um, Brian Pace has got co uh, coaching courses on there. Um, you've got Tom Lodziak. You've got actually there's going to be a course coming up soon with Brett Clark on there. Brett Clark, um, kind of the the Australian service master. I know he's working on a new um, kind of how to serve like a boss training course. Uh, so that's going to be on Table Tennis University very soon. You can sign up to the free courses there. All you need to do is join as a free member at TableTennisUniversity.com.
I'll be back next month with episode 42. I'm hoping, as I said in the show, to get Patrick Franziska um, on that episode. I think that'd be really cool. And I know that he started up this new thing called Spin Fit. You can, you can have a search online for, for that and, and you'll see what he's up to. But it looks like he's doing some kind of um, physical training, personal training type stuff. Um, and I really like talking about kind of the physical side of table tennis. I feel like often that's not, that's not given that much um, credit. And I know that all of the professionals are really working really hard in the gym and doing all their physical training. So I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that we get Patrick on the show and that he can share some um, some more advice for us regarding the physical aspect of the game. So until then, I'd just like to say thank you very much for listening. You can find out more about me at experttabletennis.com. And yeah, hopefully we'll get Patrick in the next episode, which will be released on the 1st of April. See you then.